Those who don't know me, and I'll be bringing our message from God's Word. Uh, John chapter 7, verses 1 to 24. So we'll recall from last week, and as Glendon reminded us, that uh, in chapter 6, Jesus has performed that remarkable, amazing sign, feeding 5,000 people with just a few loaves and fish. And returning to Galilee, he has explained the sign and uh, claimed to be the bread of life. And at that, many have taken offence and have left off following Jesus. So John picks up the narrative here in John chapter 7, verse 1. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judah, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe him. Therefore Jesus told them, My time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I am not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he had said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he is a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the elders, of the leaders. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle and you are all amazed. Yet because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses but from the patriarchs, You circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging me by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Thank you, Uh, Perry. And... uh... Oh, if we haven't met, my name's Aidan. I'm the the pastor here, and it's a a joy to gather on a a, a day when, you know, with great weather, if you're a duck. (laughs) Um, But not thinking of ducks, thinking about sheep, actually. Uh, And uh, that lovely prayer that Chris uh, led, uh, reminding us about how Jesus is our great shepherd. You know, he's the one who leads us, he's the one who guides us. And there are, you know, people nowadays have all kinds of different ideas about you know, what we should be looking for in leaders, in all different contexts of life. You know, what makes for a good leader? And it was uh, lovely during the week, actually. Um, got to get along to a prayer breakfast at uh, the House of, of Prayer with, with Hillary, uh, which was a lovely morning. And uh, got to meet one of our, the, the members of our Legislative Assembly, uh, who is a Christian, which I gather kind of narrows it down to exactly who it is. Um, I don't, I don't know much about the other members, but um, it was lovely to, to meet him. Uh, and and thinking last week about like how great it was to be able to hear from some of our youth sharing about the leadership development 101 course that the older youth uh, had just done as part of a combined group up at the the training hub, and uh, knowing that our, our younger youth who are still going through that uh, that course. Uh, are here with us uh, this morning as well. So I thought it's a good morning for us to think about you know, what do we look for in our leaders 
And you know, if we want to be encouraging one another to be looking to Christ, ultimately, as our great shepherd, that he is our, our leader, he is the head of this church, and I hope and pray the leader for each and every one of us in our lives. But people have many different ideas about well, who Jesus is, the kind of person that he is. It's something that was true back in Jesus' day, and it is still very true today. And what Jesus calls us to in this passage is to be people who would judge correctly, you know, not, not to be like judgmental and overly critical uh, like Jesus talks about in Matthew 7, but to be people who would judge well, to discern uh, what is true. And that's certainly our hope uh, for our youth and indeed for all of us is that we might be people who would judge correctly as we see Christ for who he is and know that, that he is a leader who is worth following. And so let's pray and let's see our leader here at work. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time we have together. We thank you for this word that you've given to us. We do pray, Lord, that as we, we see Jesus at work here in this passage, that you help us to see him for who he is, to see that he is indeed the great shepherd who loves us as his sheep and calls us to follow him. I pray, Lord, that we would be people who would know that he is a leader worth following and that we would give our lives in service, following him. That's in his name we pray. Amen. So as, uh, as Perry was uh, explaining, this uh, passage that we have here, this story, is something which happens after the feeding of the 5,000. And indeed, well after the feeding of the 5,000. We're probably about six months after that. And we're now coming up to the Feast of Tabernacles, which was one of the three great feasts that brought people to Jerusalem, and the other ones being Passover and Pentecost. Yeah, so this was, but this is, of all of them, the one that has the, the, the great crowds that would descend on Jerusalem. And uh, if you wanted to make a name for yourself, that would be the place to be. Like you need to go to Jerusalem at this moment uh, to show yourself to the world. And that is exactly what Jesus' younger half-brothers are thinking. That this is the time for Jesus to show himself. And it raises this question as we come to this passage, what is the, the purpose that Jesus has? What is his calling? Is he going to be here just as a kind of miracle worker, a kind of you know, magician who's, who's there to, to um, you know, do all these amazing things so that people will, will, will like him and he'll be famous and popular? Or is he a, a man on a particular mission? Now, for Jesus' brothers, they're thinking the former. They want him to be famous and popular. And so it says, uh, verse 3, Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee. Like you're up, up in the north at the moment. You need to go down to Judea, to Jerusalem, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. You're no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. And since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. You know, these amazing miracles that you're doing, it goes where lots of people are going to be able to see them. And the reason that they say this is show yourself to the world, in verse 5, is for even his own brothers did not believe in him. They're not saying go show yourself to the world because we, we know who you are and we, we believe you, we want everyone to know. They're saying go show yourself to the world because... We think that that is all that you are, just some kind of miracle work. You go and do your tricks so that you can be famous and popular. Because they don't yet believe that he is indeed the Son of God. It's not until after his resurrection that that would be true. But Jesus knows exactly who he is and what he is there to do. And he has come into this world on a mission that's not going to make him popular, but that would make him hated by the world. So Jesus says to them, My time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. 
Yeah, but not for me, because I'm, I've been sent here by my Father on this mission, and I need to wait for the right time for me to go up to Jerusalem to take the next step in this mission. Jesus says in verse 7, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify that its works are evil. So you go to the festival, but I am not going up to this festival. You're not, at least not now with you, because my time has not yet fully come. And after this, he stayed in Galilee. As I was preparing the sermon, I was or, thought about another leader who also had great expectations that had been placed upon him. It was Martin Luther. As he was growing up, his, his father wanted him to, to go and become a lawyer. Uh, he had a great aptitude for learning. Uh, and instead, he decides to join the church and becomes a monk. Uh, and then becomes a, a very promising rising star in the church, a young professor in biblical studies. But he saw that there was a deep problem in the church at that time. And this is in the, the 16th, early 16th century. Because one of the things, well, a number of problems with the church, but the one, one that he focused on was this practice of penance. And the teaching was that if you wanted to be forgiven for your sin then you needed to go through a, a process where you would go to a priest and confess your sin, and the priest would prescribe various tasks for you to do, and if you did them, then you would be forgiven. Or if you couldn't be bothered doing all that, you just pay some money to buy an indulgence and you don't have to worry about it. And Luther saw all of this as a mark of the corruption that had come up within the church. And he decides he's going to take a stand against it. So he writes the 95 Theses, which are published in 1517, and essentially mark the beginning of the Reformation. And it begins a chain of events that would lead him to ultimately have to stand against the Pope and against the Holy Roman Emperor. And he would be declared to be a heretic and it was only because of the political circumstances in Germany that meant he wasn't actually executed for what he had done, which would normally have been expected. And he was a man who was willing to give up everything for the sake of what he knew to be right. Because his heart was not for himself and advancing his own career and becoming popular. His heart was that Christ may be glorified. You know, people may look at us and have very different ideas about what we should do with our life, with our time in this world, the kind of people that we should be, you know, whether we should become lawyers, uh, have some kind of promising career, and you know, maybe uh, as a public servant, uh, which is um, a very good thing to do, not knocking that. I was a public servant. Uh, it's a good calling. You know, but often it comes with a challenge that like the world lays down all these expectations that we'll buy into their whole way of thinking about a whole range of different things. You know, to, to believe that there is no God, that there is no objective truth, that there is no hope beyond this life, that here and now is all that matters and we need to live according to, to their ways of thinking and their view of what is right. But... The question for us is, is our desire to please the people around us or is our desire to please our Heavenly Father? And if we have a heart for His glory, then do we know that it, it may well mean that we need to make significant sacrifices and that it will come with a cost? And the more that we stand for His Word for what is true and right and good, then we should expect more and more that this world will hate us like it hated Jesus. Because we do not worship the idols of this world. And we do not worship the idols of fame and fortune or the false gods of power and pleasure. And we worship a living God who made us and calls us to follow Him. 
He alone has the words of eternal life. And like Luther was, was reported, reputed to have said, we must say, here I stand and I can do no other. It is a glorious calling that we have to be people who would stand with Christ in the face of whatever this world may bring, to be part of his mission in this world, knowing that this is a mission that we have that is founded in the very word of God. And that's what we see here. After, after see, we see Jesus who knows that his mission, he knows his mission, he knows that that's what he needs to be devoting himself to. And it is a mission that is grounded in the word that he has received from his heavenly father. He is not some talking head, but he is indeed the man of truth. So as this passage unfolds, what we see is that uh, verse 10, however, after his brothers had left for the festival, Jesus actually does go up as well. You know, obviously, the time was then right. Uh, but he doesn't go publicly, he goes in secret. And he comes up to this, as he goes to this festival, what we find is that the Jewish leaders there are watching for Jesus, and they're asking, where is he? Yeah, because they're already opposed to him. They already want to find him so that they can, can kill him. And yeah, we know that after what had happened in, in chapter 5, when he heals the, the, the lame man by the, the pool, and within the crowd, there are all kinds of different ideas about who Jesus is. There's all this widespread whispering that is happening about him. So some people say that he is a good man. Like he's going around doing all these miracles. He's, he's feeding people. He's, he's healing them. But then others say that, no, he, we, we think he's, he's, he's deceiving people. There's something wrong about him. And no one is saying anything publicly because they're afraid of these leaders who are out there to try to kill him. And it's only then halfway through the festival that Jesus actually goes up into the temple courts and begins to teach, you know, into the place where there would have been various other teachers as well. The rabbis would have been there teaching their own followers. You know, remember, this is back in the days before TV, so this is the way that they would do it. It's like um, kind of talking heads that you get on kind of news shows or Q&A or, or whatever it might be. You know, here is teachers uh, trying to teach their followers. And what they see in Jesus is someone who is very articulate and eloquent and seems to have this wisdom in the way that he's presenting himself. And so in verse 15, the Jews there were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? Like, he hasn't been kicking around Jerusalem for years, studying under one of the, the great rabbis. Now, how does he, he know so much? How does he have this stamp of wisdom? And at that point, you know, Jesus could easily have said, well, you know, yes, I am the eternal Son of God. You know, I am the Word who has become flesh. Of course, I uh, am able to show you a depth of wisdom. But instead, uh, he wants to uh, show how to be humble uh, as a human being, especially. And so he humbles himself and he gives all of the glory to his Father. In verse 16, Jesus answered, Oh, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. And he gives the glory to the Father. And so this is something that we need to share in. We need to have the same heart for the glory of God and for his will. And if we do, the more that we, we have this heart, the more we will see and be, be sure of the truth of his word. So as Jesus says in verse 17, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. And instead of presuming to sit above God and to judge him, we need to be people who would humbly trust and follow him and walk in his ways and find that the proof is in the pudding. Now, we can find an assurance that this indeed is the word of God. We are indeed following the great shepherd. And as we do this, what we see is that Jesus is not like 
the, the Jewish leaders who were seeking praise for themselves, something we've, we've seen uh, previously in John. But instead, he is simply a man of truth. Uh, so in verse 18, whoever speaks on their own, and rather than speaking words from God, they're speaking words from themselves, they do so to gain personal glory. But he who, speak, he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth, and there is nothing false about him. You know, we can trust him. We can trust Jesus as the man of truth who speaks words from God. You know, for us, you know, we need to know that what we believe is grounded in the word of God. And uh, for Martin Luther... The only reason he was able to see the truth about the problems with this uh, doctrine and this practice of penance was because the year beforehand, uh, the year before he publishes the 95 Theses, uh, someone else by the name of Erasmus had published a version of the New Testament which had not just the, the Latin Vulgate, but also the, what, uh, the best understanding of what the original Greek text would have been. And as Luther is going through this, as someone who understood both of these languages, he comes to Matthew 4, verse 17, which we would read in our English Bibles. It says something to the effect of, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. But that's not what it said in the Latin Vulgate. In the Vulgate it said, Do penance. And do this outward act of penance. And as Luther looks over at the original Greeks, he sees that that's not what the original word meant. You know, the, the word means to repent. You know, we need to have a, a, a genuine inner change in our mind, in our hearts, to turn away from sin. And then, yes, it will lead to a life of obedience, but it needs to be us repenting in our hearts. And then we will see the kingdom of heaven coming near. It is only then that we can be saved. So when he writes the 95 Theses, the first two of them is pointing this out, that the translation in Matthew 4 is wrong. And the only way that we know the truth is if we go back to the Word of God. And so he writes in the preface to the 95 Theses, it's out of love for the truth and a desire to bring it to light. And later on, when he's reflecting on the, the Reformation as it unfolds, he says, I did nothing. The Word did everything. You know, we are called to be people who would have a love for the truth and to know that the truth can be found in the Word of God. And we're not supposed to be like this crowd and just listen to leaders and teachers because they're really articulate or really charismatic, and just because they put on a good show. We need to be like Jesus. We need to know that what we believe comes from the Word of God. And so when we're thinking about what teachers we should listen to or we should read, you know, what books we should read, what podcasts we should listen to, you know, what, what TV shows we should watch, we should ask ourselves, is this teacher someone who is seeking glory for themselves, or are they genuinely seeking glory for Christ? Yeah, are they just having, are they claiming to have a word from God so that we would look at them? Or do they take the care to show us how what they're saying is grounded and consistent with the word of God so that we look to Christ? Yeah, we need to be people who have a love for the truth, and a love for the one who is truth. As we see at the end of this passage, you know, we need to love the one who, you know, the crowds were thinking of him as being some kind of law-breaking sinner, but instead what we find here is the one who came to be our saviour. You know, so as Jesus is talking to them, he says, has not Moses given you the law, and yet not one of you keeps the law? Like, you guys are actually a whole bunch of lawbreakers. And just to give an example is, why are you trying to kill me? Like, like 
that's, like, that's one of the Ten Commandments. You shall not kill. And yet that's what the Jewish leaders there were trying to do to him. And that the crowd are like, oh, no, you, you, you're demon-possessed, which was a, an expression used to say, that, like, you're just nuts, you're, you're paranoid, you're, you're crazy. Um, not that they're the same things, but sometimes that was the expression that was used. And the crowd said, you know, well, so who's trying to kill you? And then Jesus explains in verse 21, I did one miracle, and he's talking about the one miracle that he's already done in Jerusalem, where he heals the man by the pool, in chapter 5, and you are all amazed. Like, not, not good amazed, as in now praising me for who I am, but angry amazed that I would do something so terrible as to do this work of healing someone and telling him to carry his mat on the Sabbath, you know, breaking the rules that the Pharisees have given us, you know, being a, a lawbreaker. They were amazed and shocked that Jesus would do such a thing. They thought that he was the one breaking the law and being a sinner. But nothing could be further from the truth, because he is indeed the one who is perfectly without sin. And Jesus goes on to try to show them that. He says, well, if you're worried about the Sabbath, like just think about yourselves and what you do. You know, what happens when, the, when a baby a boy is born and needs to be circumcised on the eighth day, but if he's born on one Sabbath, the eighth day then falls on the following Sabbath, that's when you're supposed to do this work of circumcising him. Are you going to do that work and keep the law of circumcision and break the law of the Sabbath? What do you do? Well, what you do is you circumcise the boy. So Jesus says, yet because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it didn't come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, because it was something that was instituted as a covenant sign with Abraham in Genesis 17. Yeah, but yeah, we have this law, circumcision, and that's what you do. You circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you so angry with me? for healing a man's whole body. Not just fixing a little part of it, but healing this man so he can pick up his mat and walk and leap for joy. You need to understand the purpose and the place of the law and what matters more. Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. You need to see that this man is not a sinner, is not a lawbreaker, but he is the one who is perfect, and he is the one who indeed came to fulfill everything that circumcision and the Sabbath was meant to point towards. Now, these marks that were given to the, the people of God in the Old Testament points to the, the fact that now we are marked not by circumcision, but marked by faith in the Christ who is the Son of God. And we find our Sabbath rest in Him. For Martin Luther, he sought to judge correctly, to look closely at the Word of God, closely at Jesus, and closely at Himself. And when he turned his gaze inward, he saw that he was far from perfect. Like he had this inner torment within him, that if he was supposed to be able to contribute something to his own salvation, some kind of good works that would help merit his salvation, that he would be completely lost. And that's what he was being taught by, by people in the church at the time. And if that was true, then there is no way that he would be able to be saved. He knew himself well enough to know that he was a sinner who was lost in his sin. He could not live the kind of perfect life like Christ did. He wouldn't be able to contribute anything to his salvation. And as he comes to Romans chapter 1, verse 17, he reads, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live 
by faith. We're not saved by anything that we do. We are saved purely by the grace of God as we put our, our faith in Christ. Later on, he'd say, it was as if the very gates of heaven had opened before me. And he was a man who knew that he was far from perfect. But he knew the one who is. And many people in this world have a very warped view of Jesus. Just like this, this crowd who thought that he was a law-breaking sinner. And now people would say things like that he's a nice guy. He just tells us to love one another and there's nothing more to it than that. We need to be people who would take the time and the effort to see Christ for who he is and to look more closely at him, to see him in Scripture and judge not by mere appearances, but to judge correctly that here we have a man who came not just to heal the body of a man by a pool, but to heal the heart and the soul of all who would come and put their faith in him. He came not just to tell us that the world is full of evil, but to be the one who would take the punishment for that sin on himself, and the punishment for our sin. And he now calls us to be part of his mission in this world, to stand on the truth of the gospel of the grace of the, our Lord Jesus Christ for His glory and for our eternal good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank You for this, this passage we've been able to spend some time camping in this morning. We pray, Lord, that we would be people who would indeed judge correctly, that we would see clearly who you are and the kind of life that you call us to in Christ. We pray, Lord, that we would know that you have called each one of us and you have called each one of our youth to be part of your mission in this world and that this is our purpose, that this is our calling. And we pray, Lord, that we would have the conviction to stand on the truth of the Word of God. And we pray, Lord, that more and more, that you would give us something of the glory of Christ in our own life, a reflection of the beauty of his character, the kind of character that shows something of the compassion and the kindness and the grace and the love of our Lord and our Saviour, our great shepherd. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.